Hi, my name is Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In um, this next installment, I'm going to begin an analysis of Geetri Spivak's um, seminal article, Can the Subaltern Speak? Um, the, the reason why I'm giving just a brief preface to um, my, my typical analysis uh, and lecture on Spivak for a number of reasons. Um, Spivak's article is a very, very dense work. Um, and you know, if you're if you're just being introduced to philosophical thought or post-colonial theory, and you pick up "Can the Subaltern Speak?" and you start to read it, it's like, what in the world is this? What is what is this woman talking about? It's it's it's. There's a lot of assumptions that you need to have prior to um, even understanding what it is that the paper is arguing for. So um, what I decided to do was to break. Um, for me, break up the seminal, what I identified as the seminal con concepts needed in order to have an understanding of Spivak's um, sort of notion of um, can the subaltern speak or answer of um, uh, the subaltern. And the reason why I'm doing this is because if you have those, if you have an understanding of not necessarily the historical background, but the, the concepts and the historical discourse around those concepts, specifically with respect to an interpretation of Marx. All of this will make sense once I believe in the lecture. But um, especially with respect to the interpretation of Marx, you'll understand what it is that um, what um, Spivak is doing and the importance of this piece. I mean, this piece was this this piece was one of the reasons why I became um, uh, a philosopher. Um, I was going to do something else with my life. I was I was actually studying um, microbiology, and I, I took um, an exit requirement at the university, and I you know I read a couple of papers. Can the subaltern speak? Was one. Um, Michael Tooley's A Justification for Infanticide was another. I read some. I read some sort of out there articles, and I was like, wow, that, you know, this is what I want to do. So I mean, I, I have a I have a, a fondness for this piece. This is one of my favorite, if not my favorite. Um, you know, book sections or articles of all time. Um, so I want to do it justice. It's not an easy lecture to prepare because Spivak's writing is so dense, um, and she has that rich sort of continental style, which is which is what I love. Um, but it's not easy. It's not easy for a, you know the first for someone who's new to philosophy. And all all of my lectures and all of my um, my YouTube channel presupposes that you know you're just new to philosophy. I know I have a lot of specialists, I have professors and graduate students, advanced graduate students that watch my stuff, but I always try to present as if you have no idea what the material is about. So before I can even get into, I'm going to stop talking now, but before I can even get into um, sort of the significance of um, her piece and the Kenneth Subaltern speak, um, which I have here, um, I needed to do some background concepts. Um, so make sure you take the time, um, I mean, if you're watching the video series, it'll come as a procession within the series, uh, but again, I just wanted to make sure that some of the main concepts are understood before we even get into what it is that she's trying to do in this in this article, because it not only does it affect the article, it affects a lot of, um, and it, you know, she made a humongous contribution to post-colonial study, post-colonial theory. So uh, uh, with that, um, I'm going to cut to me lecturing right now. Okay, so let's begin the lecture on uh, Spivak. So this will be Spivak and and the name of her article is Can the Okay, um, Can the Subaltern Speak? Um, so again, what I'm doing in this first part, and if you download the, the notes, um, obviously the notes have been updated. If you download the notes, um, just follow along. I'm going to break this sort of introductory part, introductory account into parts before we get into the analysis of what it is that she's actually doing and the implications. Um, again, having an understanding of what she's doing um, and some of the conceptual historical um, underlying discourse is necessary. It's essential to have an understanding of what she's what she's attempting to do. So this is um, the preliminary concepts needed to understand Spivak, right? So basically, this is section 4.1, 4.1, and this is uh, what you should 
know before the alpha before reading. Okay. Um, what you should know before reading Spivak. Um, the reason why I think you should know this, um, and the reason why I think it's important to have a, just a, a general understanding of what's going on, is then you'll understand the implications of uh, her research. Okay, the first thing to recognize is you should have an understanding of hegemony. And I'm not, again, as, as always, I'm going to give a generalized account. I can spend, you know, eight lectures on just the discussion of hegemony. But the reason why I constructed the videos in the manner that I did with respect to this account of theories, the reason why I, I started with revisionist history and then I moved on to um, uh, dealing with the past and so on and so on is because I believe that those concepts in that order, in that sequence, for me, not only facilitates education, but it also facilitates um, and stands for a foundation with which we can build much, much more complex concepts, right? And uh, subalternity is, and the idea of being subaltern is a very, very, one misunderstood concept, I think, right? I think a lot of people assume to be subaltern means to be oppressed or something. And in a sense, that's true, but in an even larger sense, that's false, right? So in order to um, avoid all of these contradictions and all of these complications and confusions and problems, we have to be very, very careful. Um, also, another thing that I should have said while I was while I was giving my introductory account, which I forgot to say before I actually start the lecture, is that what um, Spivak is really, really doing in this beginning phase of the piece is she's making sure that philosophers don't make the, the classical equivocation error. Equivocation, right? Equivocation is the attempt to use a word in two different senses in a construction of an argument. If you use the word, the, the classic example I give um, is the following. Um, a bat is a mammal. Right? A bat is a mammal. A bat is used to hit the ball. Both are true, right? A bat is a mammal. It's true, right? A bat is used to hit the ball. It's true. Now, I draw a conclusion from that, right? We know that in the construction of arguments, our premises have to be true. And if our premises are true, then our conclusion is true. You can't have true premises and a false conclusion, right? So if this is true and this is true, but I draw the, equ the equivocation, therefore, um, a bat... is, oh no, a mammal, sorry, sorry, therefore, therefore, uh, I'll get that in a second, hang on me. therefore a mammal, it, a mammal is used to hit the ball, right, so a bat is a mammal, true, a bat is used to hit um, the ball, true, therefore a mammal is used to hit a ball, well, that's a different type of sport, right? <laughs> we don't use um, bats in the, in the mammal sense, the animal, to hit balls, right, when we're playing a game. We don't do that. What I've done in this argument is I've equivocated. Now, for me, the one thing I, 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 I practice as a conflict resolutionist, I, I write as a conflict resolutionist, and I think one of the problems that I'm having at, at this early point in my career is that I've been trained as a philosopher, so I'm very, very, very meticulous in the use of words, and it, it makes it very, very difficult for me to, to write because I, I, I spend so much time obsessing about the meaning of the terms that I use. I actually think it's a good thing. I don't think it's problematic. Spivak um, is really, in, in the first phase of this, uh, and there are many phases of this piece, but in the first phase of her article, she's saying, um, with respect to two um, scholars, um, with respect to two scholars, Deleuze and, and Foucault, she's saying, you guys are equivocating, is what she's basically saying. She might not be saying it as harshly as that, and I'm not trying to speak for, <laughs> I'm not trying to speak for uh, uh, Gichu Spivak. She has her own, uh, she has her own voice. But my interpretation of the text is that she's saying, she's calling bluff on philosophers. She got, she's saying, you guys are doing this, right? You guys are equivocating. Um, so you do need to also understand another one of the preliminary concepts 